We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome, everybody. And um, um, if you wouldn't mind turning on the cameras, just for the for kind of the, let's let's see you all, and uh, and then later on, uh, if that's all right with all of you, I'll take a screenshot of everybody to uh, share on our social media. Of course, if you don't want to be uh, on the screenshot, turn off the camera, and that's it. And uh, yeah, so um, some of you don't know me, some of them you do, some of you do, do know me. My name is Daniel, and I'm a co-founder and a co-organizer of this uh, talk. Together we have with us in the order of my screen to the right, we have Robert Sylvie, which will be presenting with me together. The, Sylvie will go first, then Robert, then I will be at the end. Leila, you know, Elena, you know, uh, and Ali, they are uh, part of the team, they are team members. Hi, George, nice to see you uh, from USA. And uh, Adriano, as well as a part of the, the, the development team. Then we have two IGFs, welcome. And uh, Captioner and Dominic, welcome as well. Um, so yeah. Um, feel free to take up the mic and you know discuss. Let let let's not make it um, <laughs> like um, just you know me talking. Um, let's start with uh, with to my to my right, Robert. Would say would you like to say something? Or let's just you know talk a little bit uh, about stuff. Unmute and <laughs> introduce yourself mm -hmm. if you want to. Yeah. Hi. After, afternoon, Daniel. Afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Robert Herrian. Um, so I'm presently based at the, the law school of the Open University uh, here in the UK. Um, and my yeah, my research interests uh, are based in, in law and technology, uh, kind of across private law and property law, uh, a particular interest. Uh, hence why we're you know, part of the discussion around copyright today. Uh, so yeah, that, that's why I'm here. Um, looking forward to some interesting discussions today. So I'll hand over to Sylvie. Good afternoon. Yeah, I will make a presentation on the organization later when we can share the screen. So my name is Sylvie Fodor. I'm the executive director of a trade organization, um, which means we represent, um, we, you know, a federation, we federate um, visual content producers in the large, in the large meaning. Uh, I'm talking here from Berlin. <laughs> um, I'm in home office, I'm talking from my home, but we have an international membership uh, everywhere in Europe anyway. We've been very active in Brussels um, on this copyright directive, and I will say a little bit more when, uh, when it's my time to speak. If we can share the screens, I don't know. Otherwise, maybe, you know, we, if we can't share screens, we can maybe we just can say something. I don't know. I, I, can, uh, I can share my own screen. Maybe I don't know if it's a problem. I, uh, I'm just trying to help. Yeah, I apologize. I'm still struggling a little bit, but regardless, uh, thank you so much, guys, for taking the initiative. And uh, we, we already have our speaker self-introduced. Um, let me see if, uh, can you see my screen? Because I still struggle with uh, sharing for some reason. I don't think I have the right. You don't. Hmm. Okay, Leila, do you have the right screen? Actually, the screen? Excuse me, hmm. apparently I have it. Okay, well, then it's beautiful. Daniel, yeah. can you please? Uh, <laughs> sure. I really I apologize this. for sorry. <laughs> this slight technical bug. The idea was that we tested uh, 15 minutes before. But hey, oh, here we are. Okay, so, so what? I go over the center and uh, I will be the one who's clicking around, right? Yes, if you can do that, that uh, will yes. save us. Let's see. Perfect. 
here we are. Okay, so uh -huh. uh, again, um, so basically, uh, you guys, I guess, all know since since you joined the uh, agenda uh, that we're going to be talking in the remaining thirty minutes. Uh, it's uh, well, digital creative market, emerging technology, emerging regulation, with a particular focus on the EU copyright directive. Uh, some current uh, technical solutions, technical issues and limitation, and also emerging uh, technical solution with which you'll finish the discussion and then open the floor uh, to uh, Q&A. So uh, let's go right to it. Um, first, Sylvie will give us a perspective of uh, the creative industry. Uh, Sylvie, please take the floor. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so um, thank you. I'm very happy, I'm very honored to be here and to be talking about this important um, subject on behalf of our uh, varied membership. So maybe you can just go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so that's a presentation of CEPIC. I thought, you know, I'd, I'd make a short presentation. I'm not sure if everybody's familiar what trade organizations do and uh, what CEPIC does. So I said we represent uh, visual content producers. This means uh, picture agencies, but also, of course, the photographers or the videographers, uh, picture agency. Getty Images, for example, is a, is a member of us in all areas, press, talk, and, and heritage. And we also have uh, several technology providers as members. And this is not a detail, as you will see uh, and, and in my presentation. So everywhere in, the, in Europe, mostly, but we are registering, we just registered an, in, um, as a European, as an international organization um, as this month. So what do we do? We share information between members and we also fight for the interest of our members. When I mean fight for the interest, I mean mainly that we fight for copyright, for copyright online. This is why I'm here on this talk and this brings us to the next slide, please. Yes, so that's why we've been very active um, in the debates in the making of the EU copyright directive and we focused all our efforts on article 17. We, we, we've been trying for years and I mean that through different means, um, copyright legislation being just one means among others to solve the value gap. What's the value gap or the value block? It's a, the value gap is, is the name given to this disbalance that you have online, the, 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 the value of value distribution, value of content distributed by users, shared by users with online platforms such, such as Facebook or Google making a lot of money thanks to this creative content and creators very often making very little money, if not no money at all that's then value block. That's why we call it value gap, value block. And we supported, we fought for Article 17 as a tool, as a mean to solve at least partly uh, this value gap. Now, the thing is, and, um, and this is a conflict here, is that copyright, and then of course, Article 17, has always very often been presented as impeding freedom of speech. Uh, users uh, cannot share content, copyrighted content freely online. It means that their free speech is being impeached. I don't think, or members don't think that this is the case. I personally really don't think this is the case. In fact, it's a contradiction. I mean, I, I will really wish to defend copyright. Copyright is a livelihood of cre creators. Creators are creative. Uh, creative creativity is a basis of freedom of speech. Okay, so. That's for the theory. Now, how do we solve uh, this conflict in the real world? How can Article 17 both support creativity and freedom of speech? That comes to my next slide. Yes, well, technology is a key. We've always said technology is a key and among our members, we have uh, several companies that, you know, they help us a lot in our, in our consultations by providing information and they are looking at, at the market. So technology is at, it's a key, I mean, it's, it's at least one very important uh, part of the solution. On this slide, I made a difference between technology existing 
before Article 17 and technology existing after uh, Article 17 have come into being. And then I also make a difference between technology that is compatible with Article 17 and technology that enforces Article 17. Regarding the first point, it's quite obvious that uh, to have a technology, since this technology is developed and provided by private vendors, you need a market for this. So before Article 17 came into being, we have to admit that the market didn't exist for it, right? And at the moment, we are in a period of transition. Um, we are in a period of, of transition. 2019, 2021, where we have work in progress. We have several companies, some of them are members of us, working on a technology that will enforce Article 17 in full. However, what we had is that we already had technology that in that could support uh, this Article 17. That's what we had before. That's what, what was part of our consultation uh, at the EU. Um, and um, now you've seen my, uh, my quote from the Motion report here. It's a translation of the report that was made as a French government um, uh, on, on this article, implementation of Article 17, that recognition tools play a central role in the conclusion of license agreements by allowing the monetization of content and the promote the dissemination of promoted works on the internet and article 17 is intended to extend and broaden a dynamic which is favorable to creation and has already been initiated on certain platforms hence the increased importance of content recognition tools and that's where we are now we already have a uh, and technology that is compatible with Article 17. I could, of course, in the discussion, I can say more a little bit more about this, but let's say I will just give one example here for the presentation, the Google licensable badge with what they developed with CEPIC in 2018. We think it's it's compatible with Article 17. It covers a number of aspects of Article 17. And then we need, we still need, we're still working on the technology that will enforce properly this article. Um, yeah, and that's it, I guess. That was my message for today. Thank you very much. That's my last slide. Perfect. Thank you very much, Sylvie. Um, you are perfect on timing. And um, now we um, the, give the mic and the floor to Robert, which uh, is the perspective of the... Um, legal perspective and uh, the current work in the in, in the field of regulation. Um, yeah, Robert thank, thank is, yes, uh, Robert you. is a senior lecturer at the Open University and, uh, well, a pioneer uh, in terms of research and regulation and emerging technologies. Robert, uh, it's, it's all yours. Thanks very much, Lena. Um, so I just have the single slide, um, so you can all uh, entertain yourself with with reading that one statement uh, throughout my my very short presentation. But the the statement is key here. So the starting point for me really is this outline of copyright law, uh, which contains a number of important principles and variables. So copyright law provides an automatic right when work is created, and and it's the owner of that right who, in a majority of jurisdictions, will need to identify and report infringements. So the issue of copyright online or offline is not one of law's failure to provide protection for creators, artists, and so on. Um, any suggestion of an absence of law really in this regard is incorrect, whether we're talking about civil or common law jurisdictions. Uh, but just because laws are in place does not mean that they are enforced or indeed that they are enforceable in any realistic or reasonable way. So we have a gap, another gap to, to add to, to Sylvia's uh, value gap, I guess, uh, and it's a legal one. But it's one that technology may seek to fill, but equally one that continues to breed uncertainty and a lack of confidence. So as the 2004 EU Directive on the Enforcement of Intellectual Property Rights shows, confidence is low or it's even lost when an inventor or creator risks not being able to derive or have the opportunity or the potential to derive a, leg a legitimate profit from their invention or creation. And we know law and regulation have a role to play in fostering a confident copyright regime that can fa facilitate wider economic benefits for communities and for countries. So enforcement rather than a need uh, to evidence a prima facie right is required. 
but seems to be an intractable problem. Uh, certainly as innovation systems and networks continues to make copyright infringement perhaps easier and more widespread or uh, equally perhaps less detectable. Now, Article 17 of the Copyright Directive requires online content sharing service providers or OCSSPs to obtain authorization from rights holders before they add copyright protected content to a platform. And OCSSPs will be liable for content they share without prior authorization, unless the OCSSP has made best efforts to one, obtain an authorization, two, to block unauthorized content and ensure that it remains blocked, and three, promptly block or remove unauthorized content once notified. The question is whether such measures can successfully mitigate weaknesses in enforcement when infringements do occur. So without a means of reliable action enforcement for breaches or infringement of copyright, an inventor or creator cannot confidently allow the widest possible dissemination of their works, ideas, and new know-how. And at the same time, enforcement should not hamper freedom of expression, the freedom of information, or the protection of personal data uh, on the internet or otherwise. So in the UK and the US and certain EU countries such as France, Italy and the Netherlands, infringements are tackled from both the supply side, that's content providers and other companies that facilitate access to material that infringes copyright online, and the demand side, so that's from individual subscribers. Although approaches do differ, there are universal aspects to the laws and policies put in place to tackle copyright infringement. So these include increasingly severe warnings and fines for demand side infringements and policies for taking down content in cases of supply side infringements, as well as, as, well as follow the money approaches that target stakeholders involved in copyright infringement, such as those who monetize content. Now, educating against copyright infringement is also seen as a worthwhile measure, although its effectiveness is really debatable. South Korea uh, is arguably uh, the most progressive legal regime for tackling copyright infringement, including a distributed network of extrajudicial actors, notably the general public, who assume responsibility for identifying and reporting infringements, as well as a relatively successful judicial system that is able to terminate ISP accounts and apply injunctions to prevent offenders from further infringing. However, in progressive systems such as South Korea, dealing with copyright issues is incredibly labor intensive. It's a form of data and information laboring for which the public, for example, are not necessarily compensated. Uh, although we might argue there is a moral obligation to foster fair and just online spaces for all, which outweighs the financial reward an individual might expect. Technical measures in the form of automation of the tasks of identifying and reporting copyright infringement seems the obvious response, and one noted in part in the recent judgment of the Court of Justice of the European Union on the request of a preliminary ruling made by the German Federal Court of Justice in relation to two proceedings concerning unauthorised uploading of copyright content to YouTube and to Uploaded, which is a file hosting and sharing platform. So of particular interest to me, I suppose in my own work, are semantic systems that are able to recreate and interpret existing legal regulatory provisions and deploy them as effectively as extrajudicial and judicial means presently to hand. But I do wanna stress that this is not an answer rooted in a technological workaround of the law as we find it offline really about technology using laws that in many cases we already have. So that is technology, technology finding itself in the law, therefore, not the other way around. So back to you, Elena. Yeah, thank you so much, Robert. And uh, I just uh, heard from the organizers that they can kindly uh, give us five extra minutes since we weren't able to start on time. Um, so uh, without further ado, Daniel, uh, please continue uh, with the technical uh, perspective on the issue. All right. Uh, as Robert said, yeah. Okay. It's not let's not, use, lost, task, let's not, let's not use, lose more time. I'm gonna run through this. Thanks Robert, thanks Sylvie. So um, to kind of connect what I'm gonna talk about which is technical part a little bit and Robert is that 
uh, the real world copyright is a very hard to verify the digital world because you need identifiers. And today uh, we mostly see technical solutions focused on preventive and restrictive approach like upload filters or blocking or other ones and a not working technology that is, uh, that is used to actually enable digital copyrights and, cre and create them as they should be created in a digital world. Uh, this slide is, let's start. Hey. One of the biggest challenges in the multimedia domain is to identify the image correctly and with the precision. The main reason is that the image metadata standard does not enforce creation of unique identifiers. Due to that reason, we need to create another approach aside from the metadata standard. We needed three different identifiers, at least content addressing, multiple identifiers are gonna be a combo of them and the feature-based identifiers. The image here that you see is actually a working workflow, working prototype of a multi, multiple identifier generation workflow, which, cre uh, which creates two cryptographic keys or cryptographic identifiers and one uh, uh, perceptual hash or a feature-based identifier, which widely is used in a reverse image search uh, and in an AI uh, model um, training. Next slide. Um, in the previous slide, we saw that the content identifiers are important in, gener in creation of a digital copyright. Now we will talk about important identifiers which enable the connection between the real world assets and the user identity in a digital world. For example, you can see in this, on this screen, it's, a, it's an output of a simple program uh, that of eight images, the three images are taken with a, with a professional camera and four with a mobile phone. The camera model plus the serial number is the unique identifier of a, such a device, which unfortunately does not have an information enough for the mobile phones, which is majority of the, which are the, the devices that are used much in majority of the time, most of the time in creating the images. Uh, at the end, uh, the original document ID is supposed to, in a standard, uh, as defined in standard, it says that this is the a mother identifier from all which derivations come. So it, it is possible to track them to the original image, all the renditions and modifications, which <laughs> unfortunately mobile phones do not provide. And like that's not enough of uh, violation of the metadata standard, the mobile phones are actually providing some identifiers in a software definitions, which is not meant to be used like that. The software is still, it should be there to identify which software has been used to modify, not create. So this is the real world asset problem. This slide is about connecting the previous two slides. Um, there is a saying in the Web3 world, and that's, if you have access to your private key, you have access to your assets, Bitcoin or a copyright statement. In this case, in this example, we can see a working version of Web3 a copyright statement. It consists of the blockchain specific public address or most commonly an account ID, a signature section, uh, which act as a real world classic signatures by hand and a claim, uh, come on and a claim which contains the proportion amount in which claim is uh, which copyright is claimed and additional resources like proof of existence of the real world asset from the previous slide. On the other hand, all this is possible to be trans uh, the only way to make this transparent and auditable is through this thing called rule ID, which is actually a clean, transparent workflow of executing from, uh, from a data to the actually uh, proofs, which are bundled uh, into claims, which are bundled together with the digital signatures into the final copyright statements. End. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And so we have five uh, minutes for Q and A. <laughs> yes, we have we have ten minutes for, for ten Q minutes. &A. Excellent. Extra, extra extra minute. Um, so um, if anyone in the in the audience. Uh, has anything to add, has any questions, particular questions to our speakers, 
knows uh, the time. So, unfortunately, uh, I believe the most of the audience is on uh, the YouTube channel with the YouTube stream, uh, watching the YouTube stream uh, because of some technical issues. Uh, so, people who are here, uh, you have a unique chance <laughs> to, uh, to be picked anyway, <laughs> just so randomly. <laughs> Come on, don't be afraid, people. It's all right. Uh, Sylvie, if you if you have something to add or yes, please, uh, Robert. Now we have extra time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've I've got a question to put back to, to Daniel, really, which is this. Um, to, the, I, I mean, I suppose to unpack the the, the notion of transparency. Uh, I, I mean, in your slide there, uh, you described transparency as you were sort of uh, passing the cursor over a. A series of of letters and, and numbers. Yes. In, in other words, it's it's not a what most people would consider an ordinary interpretation of transparency. So, how do, how do we reach a level of transparency which is more inclusive? Hmm. Well, how would you define inclusive? We are well, from different uh, domains. Inclusive means different, probably. Uh, well, 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 okay, okay. So, so in, inclusive uh, to, to the sense, in the sense of of those who who uh, may not uh, understand uh, a series of of figures, uh, letters, or numbers ah, well, as as transparent. Right. Well, in that, well, this is not meant to be read by 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 uh, end user. This is uh, this this will be how we call it beautified. Uh, via the UI or the applications. This is this what I showed uh, in the sli last slide is actually the output from the actual from the blockchain. It's like a, it's, a, it's a structure of a, of a statement. All the values are just uh, they're just the actual values, mm. and they uh, since they are strings and, and, and as you said letters, um, they are actual links to other things. Yeah. And if you would have a UI or a mobile application that you would say, hey, I'd like to see my, my statement or my copyright or this image, does it have a copyright? Uh, it, would or, uh, it would say yes or no. Basically, if it can find a record, then it has it. If it, does, if it can't find a record, then it will know. And then if it finds a record, then we'd say, well, okay, so what are the details? So it would be nicely shaped in a table or whatever, mm -hmm. however UI des designers decide to show it. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I guess I mean just to follow up on that really quickly. So I, I I'm quite interested in this because it's I mean it it may seem um, perhaps somewhat irrelevant, but I but I'm wondering how important it really is if we're going to use if we're going to talk about transparency seriously. When does transparency really begin in in the process? So if it only begins at the point of design, uh, at the point of a uh, as you say, a kind of an easily interpretable uh, end user interface. Um, actually, is, is, is that too late? Should, should we be yeah, talking actually, about the transparency, transparency that starts earlier? Trans, trans, sorry, but that transparency ends with that. That's yeah. like the end cycle of, of transparency. Mm. The beginning of a transparency is when you, if, if you think of it, my la like left hand is a data. Mm. And then uh, I have uh, in, in my um, first slide, I think I talked about workflow and that awesome thing that goes from left to right. And all the, there is an image of universe on the right, side, right hand side. That is where the uh, that is where the transparency starts. So on that right hand side, uh, where where you add, where you start creating all the all the all the proofs, all the we call them proofs, but they are essentially identifiers that act as as a proof. So if you if you think of it in a in, uh, as a like if you want to say, is this image um, equal as this one? So you there are. There are two ways to do it, like either cryptographically, which you always aim for 100% uniqueness, or a perceptual hash, which is also known as a local sensitive hashing, which provides similarity on a, on a feature base. So for example, if I would look at all our images here and I would crop them and I would run them through the perceptual hash, we would have 90 plus some similarity because we all have a head and roughly around the center of the screen. So the higher the, 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 the perceptual hash is similar to another perceptual hash, uh, it's more similar, the images are more similar. Basically 100% is equal image. But that also, if you say that you have three of the identifiers and two says nothing, like said, it's not equal. They are cryptographic in nature, which means that a byte changed, they change. 
And then you could say like, okay, I give more weight to the perceptual hash, but it's subjective. We do not, uh, the idea that how we think of it, we do not enforce the weight. It's, it's actually, actually it's weight is on you and people like you, Robert, where you would go like either get on the court, get, you know, defend that. Uh, and then you would say, well, yes, similarity is more important than actually cryptographic hash, which we both know that it's, it's, it's very, um, it's very easy to change. So to each step of the way to the end of the statement uh, is transparent. You can see exactly what has been done, how it has been done. What you cannot see is what is the data. The data is never saved. The data is never leaves the, the users, I don't know, uh, either UI or mobile phone or, or, or environment, let's say like that. And it's never stored. We, we, like, uh, we, we are creating like we never touch it. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Uh, right. So, a few minutes if anyone in the audience has a question. Uh, yes, otherwise, yes. I, I suggest, if, if not, if uh, nobody raises a hand, I suggest uh, Daniel, Robert, Sylvie, uh, please, some short closing statement uh, from you for on the topic of our discussion. So, nobody has anything to uh, add? Mikko, I, George? It, it would have been interesting Sylvie. to know if. If I can say something, of course. Uh, we, I know we don't have so much time, unfortunately, but the, the motivation of the people who participated in this, um, in this, in this session. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is that uh, usually I do this kind of presentations uh, in, in front of specialist people who are really deal with the subject on a day to day, -day basis. Um, and if I don't know if anybody wants to say about something, but it it would be, or maybe after the after the presentation, if we could know the motivation, um, yeah, the the motivation, it would be interesting for my from my perspective as a presenter. And if not now, uh, the platform allows to send a message to. Uh, the organizers, and also you can use the hashtag yes. LT, LT30, which is the hashtag uh, of the session on Twitter, LinkedIn, or which uh, other kind of social media. So we can also follow up even after uh, the call and continue the discussion if you have anything to add. Excellent. That's it. Uh, no questions, Nada, Nada. Uh, George, George is asking something. Hi, Robert. George, you can you can speak. Well, speak uh, oh, uh, I've got the, the power. Oh, for God's sake! All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good morning from Los Angeles, um, Robert. I have a question about um, litigation in the UK. If of uh, if it's uh, not far long enough, but have you seen any um, litigation with contracts in the blockchain? Hi George, yeah, thanks for thanks for the question. Um, no, there hasn't really been a great deal. There, there was some interesting um, sort of movements around uh, continuing to to look at sort of definitions of um, of cryptocurrencies in terms of property uh, and things which tie back obviously to to the blockchain, but not necessarily. Uh, I mean, by contracts, Ed, you mean smart contracts, or are you talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I have... Yeah, yeah. yeah um, so uh, no, uh, not not really, because the. Uh, I mean, we've just completed, well, the Law Commission's just completed, and I was part of it, a, a, a very interesting sort of analysis of, of the present law of, of contract uh, in relation to smart contracts and, and kind of reached the conclusion that actually the existing law is capable of capturing any issues that may arise in relation to smart contracts. Uh, so I, I would be, uh, I, would, I would imagine that there may now be sort of litigation which follows in the wake of that because there will be people essentially testing um, how rigorous contract or traditional contract law and theory is in relation to what smart contracts can do. Um, so now that that kind of position has been set out, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if we start seeing um, the kind of the, the more deployment of smart contracts in there and therefore sort of more failures um, of, of certain situations which were needed to be tested in court. 
so yes, they're, they're definitely on the horizon, but nothing, nothing um, significant at the moment. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, um, Daniel, I have a question. Or I had one, I think it just escaped me. But um, mm -hmm. is there is there monetization somewhere along this uh, this blockchain sequence uh, yes. for for photography? Is it would it be the end user and and how, how do you determine the monetization and, and how does that work? I how, or how are you proposing it would work? I I believe that's more for Elena than me. All She's right. the business side. <laughs> All right, Elena. Uh, right. So I'm. I see that we are not kicked out from the session yet, uh, even though we're over time. So uh, I'll I'll continue. But just in case, if if the recording uh, will stop, um, I would like to thank everyone to join us for joining us today.